Welcome everyone. Hi, uh, my name is Pierre Giacomo. I'm Vice President of the Blockchain Acceleration Foundation. Uh, we're a 501c3 nonprofit that uh, starts accredited blockchain courses at universities, uh, produces its own curriculum, uh, and uh, generally like accelerates education uh, uh, in the blockchain space. space. Um, I'm very excited to be here today uh, with Rajiv. Um, Rajiv, I'm sorry, I'm not going to try to pronounce your last name because I know I'm going to be butchering it. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, Rajiv is an expert in cybersecurity um, and um, an expert in smart contract auditing. Um, I'm here also with Jacob, who's a, a technical education lead at BAF. Uh, he's been running a, a Solidity course for the past three months, and I'm very happy to be, ha be seeing this conversation between these two educators and uh, um, great titans, I would say. Um, so Jacob, I'll hand it off to you uh, to introduce our guest. And then Rajiv has a little presentation for us. And for everyone, uh, if you have questions, please drop them in the uh, general chat as Rajiv speaks, or there's also a Q&A section uh, uh, where you can post your questions and upvote other people's questions. Um, so uh, without further ado, Jacob, you can take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much, PG, for that great introduction. Yeah, so um, reminder, there will be a uh, time for questions after the presentation. Um, and yeah, so let me just introduce Rajiv. So Rajiv is the founder of Securium, which is a newsletter. And uh, also he's starting a um, like uh, smart contract boot camp for, for smart contract security. Um, and the entire Securium project is an effort to further improve the state of security on Ethereum. Uh, in the past, he's worked on security R&D across uh, academia, different areas of the industry, and startups. So with a warm welcome, Rajiv, the stage is all yours. Take it away. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, for the introduction, and uh, thanks, PG, and the rest of uh, the BAF network for uh, having me here. I know that uh, it's a bit early for folks on the Pacific uh, time zone, but if it uh, comforts you, I am uh, in India where it is, uh, you know, it's past 9 p.m. So, uh, so with that, uh, let's get started. I mean, uh, it's, it's a fantastic topic. Um, I don't know where uh, you all are dying from, what you're back but I'm led to believe that uh, many of you are uh, from various blockchain associations of uh, different universities in the US, Europe and around the world. Um, and uh, some of you are professionals working in the security industry or uh, in technology or even other industries. So start sharing a presentation uh, just to sort of guide us. And let me know if this pops us into. All right. Uh, can you guys see what I'm sharing? So yeah, um, as Jacob mentioned, uh, I'm doing this effort um, called Securium, which is uh, sort of new. It's, uh, morphed in uh, what it's been doing. It started sort of as a weekend project, uh, writing newsletters about smart contract security, uh, the various audits and uh, other aspects of security on Ethereum. And that's really the genesis of the word. So it's security and Ethereum, so security. But today the focus uh, is really about smart contract security, right? And uh, specifically the context of uh, why is that important? If uh, any of you is not familiar with either smart contracts or security, we'll, we'll see as to why that is critical uh, on Ethereum and even on any other blockchain. And um, basically, we'll spend a lot of time in this discussion talking about uh, the differences between Web 2 and uh, Web 3, right? Um, and and uh, the impact those changes have on uh, the security aspects, a uh, lot of the security aspects of the entire life cycle, not just uh, not just the auditing part uh, that you might have heard. 
And by the way, uh, so I am on uh, sort of on a full screen mode uh, for my presentation, so I won't be able to see the chats or uh, the questions that are being posed on this uh, forum. So uh, Jacob, PG, anyone else, uh, please feel free. I, I don't think there are many of us, there are probably 15 or 20. Uh, so uh, feel free to unmute if that's possible, uh, just at any point. This is uh, best done as a question, as opposed to uh, monologue. Right. Um, so if you're new to the space, then you might not have seen this on uh, Twitter. So this was uh, just two days ago. Uh, there was this notice that was posted by uh, an account from Poly Network. And um, I had not heard of this. And it turns out that many people in the space had not, uh, had not heard of this project. But the notice, uh, as you see, essentially said, hey, you know, there's, uh, there was a hack. And that particular protocol or project was uh, quote unquote attack on multiple blockchains, right? Binance, Ethereum, Polygon. And these assets were transferred to the hackers' addresses, right? And you actually see the addresses uh, being listed. And what was interesting was the amount that was uh, exploited. This was 600 million US dollars. Right, and uh, I mean this is uh, typically not surprising to see billions of dollars being exploited if uh, you are working in smart contract security. That's become sort of uh, unfortunately the norm, and people are somewhat sensitized to these numbers. But this particular hack was an order of magnitude higher than any of the ones we have seen in the past. Right. We had never seen, at least uh, publicly, a um, smart contract or network, uh, you know, protocol, in this case, poly network, being hacked for $600 million. So the numbers until now were mostly in the tens of millions of dollars. So this is, uh, you know, this is uh, from a publication called Rect uh, that you can up online. And they sort of maintain a um, leaderboard of uh, projects that have got attacked, uh, that have got explored. And here you see the number one until two days ago was this project here that had got exploited for $59 million, right? And all the others were like 57 million, 45 million. And the last one, I think, was uh, the top 10 were uh, about $25 million. So that is what we've seen, but exploit two days ago was $600 million, right? So it obviously was huge. And uh, the other surprising aspect was that many people had not heard of this project. And this was also unique in many other ways because it was uh, not a project on one blockchain. It was actually a cross-chain project across Binance, Ethereum, Polygon, and maybe even others. A lot of these details uh, are being Look at um, some uh, uh, reports published of, of postmortem analysis. Uh, so feel free to take a look at them. And this is really the scale of the exploits that we are talking about, right? The financial damage, if you will. So that should sort of, uh, you know, uh, wake all of us up because uh, 600 million. I mean, it's no joke, right? And uh, uh, you'll see that there are many aspects of Web3 that make any sort of intervention in the form of incident response really, really hard. And in many cases, you know, impossible. So hopefully that has motivated all of us. Um, now let's take a look at, you know, smart contract security in this background, right? Or with this uh, background. So clearly, uh, if, if you haven't been in this uh, applications are referred to as smart contracts or protocols in general, but uh, they are really not contracts in legal uh, sense, any legal definition. And uh, they are definitely, I mean, many of them are definitely not smart because uh, they are insecure and they've gotten exploited in many, many different ways. Right, so we can really strike all these things off because that is all really aspirational, uh, that uh, you know, aspirational goals that we are uh, progressing towards. 
um, something that we really have a long way to go and achieve. Let's sort of step back and uh, for uh, for those of us who aren't uh, familiar with Ethereum or the blockchain, let's uh, do a quick refresh. Um, Ethereum in its white paper uh, that came out about six, seven years ago was um, uh, a successor to the Bitcoin blockchain. Bitcoin is something hopefully you're familiar with. This was uh, motivated or uh, the vision was for Ethereum to be a next generation blockchain that supports arbitrary Turing complete smart contracts and enables a decentralized application platform. So these are all sort of uh, really heavy hitting words. Um, and the properties that Ethereum really aspires to, or any Web3 blockchain really aspires to provide is that of uh, permissionless applications that have built-in economics or crypto economics that you might've heard of with the goal of providing high ability, high ability and high transparency. And all these really are aspired to provide a platform that is new to everyone deploying on the platform as well as the platform. We'll talk more about this uh, later on. And uh, the side effects Right, of this are that the platform becomes censorship resistant. And for certain applications like uh, financial applications, you might have heard of DeFi, decentralized finance, this lowers the counterparty risk. Right? So these are really, really hard properties to achieve, um, especially given the context of Web2 that we are so familiar with and that we use day in and day out. So Web3 is really what is being built to, uh, towards these properties to achieve the purposes that we talked about. Permissionless, trust minimized, censorship resistance, right? I mean, this is the sort of the aspirational ultimate goal. Uh, and uh, we often see references to how a certain blockchain is not completely decentralized, how a certain protocols still has many centralized uh, actors or centralized actions. Um, and this is typically a stage of uh, progressive centralization as it's called. Where, uh, a lot of these platforms start out as being centralized to a certain extent, mainly with Bitcoin. Uh, there are a couple of um, you know people, I mean, if uh, whoever Satoshi uh, Nakamoto is or were, um, the gen of Bitcoin um, uh, protocol, uh, the white paper or uh, development of uh, the code. If you trace back and look up um, the, the various GitHub uh, entries, right? Uh, there were very few people involved in the beginning. And then over time, it has, over the last 12, 13 years, it's come to a stage wherein uh, the level of decentralization is, uh, you know, is really high. And the same holds good for Ethereum. Uh, to a great extent and uh, for some of the other blockchains as well. So these Web3 infrastructures or protocols or applications are uh, really being built on fundamental, um, you know, fundamentally different architectures um, compared to Web2. Web3 is all about the peer-to-peer -peer architectures where we don't have this concept of a client server paradigm that we are so used to in Web2. And this applies to compute, applies to storage, applies to network. And in the Ethereum case, Ethereum is really the compute part and the equivalent storage network part shown here. And Web3 is also really, really big about privacy and anonymity. And these have big influences on how we think about security in this space. Okay. All these fundamental shifts, right? I mean, this has really been as a paradigm shift in computing, uh, you know, uh, like web one, PCs, mobiles, the cloud, and then we have a decentralized web, right? Which is web three. This does not mean that we are really throwing away everything that we have uh, built and learned from web two. A lot of the principles and practices, even from a security perspective, are very relevant here. Some of them significantly, some of them do not apply at all. 
we'll uh, see more of those later on. So in many, many ways, um, Web3 security is a paradigm shift, right? I mean, this is an often abused sort of uh, buzzword, um, and uh, we can really, I mean, each of you can evaluate whether it is a paradigm shift or not. Let's uh, take a look at some of the differences, again, of Web3. We talked about the platform, the peer-to-peer -peer aspect. Now, if you look at the religious aspect, right, which are fundamental to how applications are built and deployed on uh, these platforms, Web2, you have a long, long list of programming languages, uh, you know, that um, all of us are uh, hopefully familiar with. Um, there is C, C++, I mean, you go back to the Unix days, uh, people started coding assembly, and then you have Fortran and Pascal and all these things. And over time, today, you do see a lot of JavaScript. You do see some of the newer languages like Golang, Rust, and uh, even languages that you may not be familiar with, such as uh, Nim, that are uh, being used in some critical applications. But Web3 um, is, again, has many languages. Well, has languages that are particular to the web component, because there is a web component to Web3. And then there is a smart contact component. So everything that's related to the web component is very similar to the web two aspects we talked about. But the smart contact component with the apps that run down the chain, these are new, right? And the languages that these are uh, written in are also new. And in the case of Ethereum, we have uh, Solidity, Viper, and a few other uh, work in progress. And by far, Solidity is the most widely used smart contract language on Ethereum, right? By um, a significant margin. And uh, the other big difference, as you would have obviously noticed, is uh, what is referred to as an on chain component versus an off chain component. Web2 is really all about off chain because uh, we do not have the concept of a blockchain in Web2. Whereas with Web3, we have the blockchain component, which is uh, referred to as chain, everything that is on the blockchain. And then you have the off-chain component, right? So everything off the blockchain, the web component, the user interfaces, or maybe even mobile apps that interact with the on-chain smart contracts. So from a security perspective, we need to evaluate the security of the off-chain components as well as the on-chain components. Right. So the off-chain components, again, the web stuff that we're all familiar with, maybe uh, there are no differences. But the main difference is in the on-chain component, which is smart contract. And this brings us to smart contract security and the, the importance of smart contract security in uh, Ethereum or Web3. Right. So uh, hopefully that motivates uh, the reason why smart contracts are sort of uh, the biggest difference in Web3, the reason why their security is uh, uh, critical, but also something very new that uh, we have to consider. And in the remaining presentation, in the remaining discussion, I would like to touch upon some very high level aspects that, uh, that are sort of distilled uh, and sort of categorized that make Web3 security different from Web2 security. But before I do that, let me pause here and see if uh, there were any questions on the chat and uh, if there were any other questions. Okay, I do see some questions on uh, the Q&A channel, but uh, if others have anything else, please feel free to uh, Unmute if you can, and uh, all right. Yeah, so if you wanted to, uh, we could go through some of the Q&A right now that has been posted already. Sure. First one is, has any DeFi hacker ever been caught? Um, I believe um, well, DeFi is uh, probably a narrow thing. I mean, there have been uh, many other sort of uh, hacks related to um, 
crypto exchanges um, and and uh, related aspects, and I, some of them have been uh, charged. Um, I don't know being caught, but uh, I mean at a high level, uh, a lot of these uh, had, uh, hackers or attackers have been uh, identified at least by their addresses or pseudonyms, um, and there have been uh, you know allegation uh, again. Uh, in some cases, turned over the the funds that were exploited, uh, the tokens or ether or bitcoins that have, uh, you know that they had exploited, and turned them uh, to the crypto projects or in some protocol uh, projects themselves. So, so yes, what's the best source for post mortem reports? Um, I think Rekt R E K T uh, the the one that I referenced earlier on, that is a good source. Uh, again, a lot of this uh, is on Twitter. So there are multiple handles uh, that I can later uh, for, for people who actually do this kind of post-mortem analysis uh, on um, sort of a, you know, Twitter storm itself, right? And um, there are some auditing companies that do this. Um, there is uh, the Securium newsletter uh, itself, where I've actually done really a very of them, um, so so all all those are good options, and, and uh, I will share this with uh, the BAF uh, organizers if if you uh, can catch us references. The next one: What's the benefit of having a blockchain that is secured by thousands of nodes validators if smart contracts can be easily exploited? Uh, I think uh, they're uh, they're in different layers, right? I mean, the nodes and validators are sort of uh, at a platform level. Uh, put these as uh, um, the cloud providers, right? Uh, be AWS or Google Cloud. So all these are centralized providers of hardware uh, compute, uh, and blockchain sort of provides you that similar capability, except in a decentralized fashion, where you don't have to trust one vendor. And smart contracts are applications that are deployed on top of them, right? And because, and we'll, we'll get into this uh, more, but like I mentioned, these platforms are permissionless. So anyone can deploy um, any smart contract on these blockchains. They do not have an app. They do not have a Google Play Store where uh, a centralized third party vets these smart contracts for uh, you know potential bugs or trojans or any kinds of uh, um, um, hacks right any kinds of uh, attacks or vulnerabilities that could be inherent to the contract itself. so that i think is uh, sort of the reason uh, people do deploy all this I will talk more about the security of those and the easily exploited part. I think is uh, the, the bar is definitely raising. Um, we do see huge attacks uh, like the ones we mentioned, uh, and that's um, and and I'll talk about why that is happening. At least my uh, hypothesis: why those uh, why these and exploits are. So these are sort of what uh, uh, we have. Causality that hey, you have a validator, smart contracts should not be added, right? So they're at two levels. The most secure blockchain, in your opinion? Um, so this is again a very loaded thing. I mean, secure, uh, I mean, very different things uh, to different people. Um, there are many blockchains, uh, you know, uh, that are not widely used, that you know, maybe do not have many contracts or running that have uh, not been exploited at all for uh, as a PSA. Uh, but there are blockchains that are very decentralized, have a lot of these validators uh, or miners uh, that are providing this crypto uh, economic security. And in that sense, it's the most secure. Uh, and and uh, Ethereum definitely is, uh, you know, is one of the leaders in that aspect. Along with Bitcoin and maybe a few others in that list, right? So this is uh, something. I mean, there are many layers to peel here. So uh, any one answer would be correct. So I'll resist uh, giving that one answer. Um, the question is, uh, how to design security testing for blockchain interoperability? Great question. This is uh, 
I'll sort of take this, I'll, I'll sort of point uh, this to one of the slides that actually talks exactly about this. All right, so with that, uh, let me go to time that we have. I think we have maybe a 20 minutes. So I'll, I'll just bring some of these slides and to uh, post the questions if these are not clearer uh, about any of these aspects. But this does address some of the questions that were uh, just posted, right? Uh, open source and, uh, I, I, sorry, let me step back. So the reasons why Web3 security or Ethereum security um, is different from the traditional Web2 security is because of um, the 10 factors that, that I think contribute to that aspect. So we'll talk about each one of those. The first one is open source transparent fault. Um, so this space is completely, uh, I mean, transparency is king, right? So there is really no scope for security by obscurity, be it uh, you know, proprietary products where you don't to have access to the source code. I mean, get to a lot of the operating systems we use if you're using Windows, if you're using uh, you know, MacBooks, you know, app uh, ecosystem, um, or uh, you know, any of the really popular widely used systems, a lot of them, right, majority are proprietary. Contrast with the whole open source movement with Linux and um, so the, that's that's a different scope, right? So compared to that, look at Web3, everything is expected to be open source. Now, some of them might be not open source, you know, some of the front ends for uh, uh, the popular applications uh, that you're you know, familiar with might not be open source, but there's definitely a push by the community, by the users. And uh, in smart contracts, they're expected to be verified as well. So uh, not just enough if you source your contract, but there needs to be a guarantee that the version deployed on the blockchain is uh, you know, in, in uh, the binary version, right? The, the one in bytecode is or corresponds to the source code and this correspondence has been verified by some, uh, you know, someone, right? Some entity. So that's the contract. Um, all the transactions, right, and all the blockchain state, it's publicly accessible, right? I mean, in the case of Ethereum, that's definitely the case. So you can run an Ethereum node, uh, anyone can run it. Um, you can, if you don't want to run it, you can, uh, you know, use what are known as block explorers, which are really uh, front end um, portal to such uh, nodes where you can look at all the historical transactions from the Genesis block. Right, uh, six years ago. You can look at the blocks, evaluate every transaction, the accounts, the addresses, the value, the tokens that were transferred, everything. Right? So this can be done in real time as well as historically. So all these are on the blockchain. And even the transactions that are waiting to get into the blockchain, uh, that are in what is known as a pool, uh, pending transactions, those can be um, you know, as well, right? Uh, very easy to do that. So, uh, I mean, you can, from a security perspective, uh, any security by obscurity that Web2 products relied on, it's um, really not, you know, not an option. The second part, second uh, sort of high level idea is that of Web3 components being unstoppable and immutable, right? Um, so these again, Immutable is something you know, that uh, comes up often with uh, blockchain, you know, because of the way they're structured, the hashes, the linking, and so on. But even with smart contracts, the aspirational goal is that once it is deployed, the contract should not change because it breaks of a social uh, uh, agreement with the users, right? Um, and we'll we'll see about how this whole space is about verify. And not so everything be um, in a manner that you can verify without trusting any centralized third party. You should be able to run your own node. You should be able to examine the contract source code. You should be able to do everything yourself, right? So that's sort of the ethos of this space. So that immutability 
is um, is really great. And there's also the concept of stoppability. That once these contracts are deployed, technically they should, I mean, the owners who deployed it or uh, any governing entity over uh, those contracts should not have the capability to not, not just change the contracts, but also to stop it, right? And that's the goal. So these two aspects are great, but if you think about it from a security perspective and how security gets deployed today, right? Look at all your applications, mobile apps, right? All your uh, laptops. We have software enabled by Amazon, right? These come in with bug fixes, with critical bug fixes, with uh, optimizations and so on. I mean, these, you don't even have to click, right? These are just happening. We have just used to uh, the Apples or Microsoft or the Android, the Googles of the world, change, making these changes, right, updates, and pushing them. So that is great for fixing bugs or for doing incident response, but if things are unmutable and immutable, how do you deal with bugs that are present in smart contracts? Or if there is an exploit, how do you deal with incident response, right? So these are, I mean, it's easy to sort of point fingers and say, oh yeah, I mean, this is not secure, smart contracts, great. Um, you know, they have bugs, they've been exploited. So it's, uh, everything is broken, right? But if you think about how, or what Web3 is about and how that impacts security, these aspects really change the game, right? It makes security so much harder uh, to design, to, you know, even from an OPSEC perspective, it's really, really hard. The third one is, uh, is what I uh, refer to as sort of uh, pseudonymity and DAOs, right? Um, many of the teams, um, I mean, go all the way to Satoshi Nakamoto, right? You have no clue who that is, what that is, right? Any of that. Um, and a lot of that is, applicable to the various teams in uh, the Web3 as well. There are many project teams. Um, uh, lately, this has been sort on as well, where entire teams, or, or at least people in those teams, contributors, developers, right, um, are known only by their GitHub handle, or Twitter handle, or, or whatever, right, or uh, uh, any of their handles. You have no clue who they are, right? Um, for all you know, uh, it's unlikely you'll find them on LinkedIn, right? And and uh, something showing a handle to their LinkedIn, right? Um, so that is the pseudonymity part. And then there's a concept of DAOs, right? Uh, DAOs are uh, decentralized autonomous organizations. Uh, so these are really communities of token holders of a particular project that make decisions, governance decisions using uh, voting, right? So these two have, these two play a huge role in security, right? Pseudonymity, really, uh, there is nothing that we can attribute to any historical reputation or trustworthiness because of uh, who that person is or what that entity is, uh, or you know who has funded that or uh, how it's listed on a particular app store, none of that, right? You don't have any of that. So you really don't have any sort of legal or social accountability because of these reasons, right? And this is, um, again, ethos of the space is to um, not trust the wetware, that's humans. There's, by design, wetware is not to be trusted. Software, I mean, code is what is known as law, right? Code is law, code is king, whatever your uh, you know, favorite meme is, right? So that is, again, the ethos or the aspiration of the space that plays a huge impact on security, right? Because you don't have these supporting structures. Then DAOs, decision-making DAOs by voting, that doesn't happen, you know, um, in a second, right? So if there are security decisions, if there are contact changes that need to be made, if that's possible, and if that has to be made by the DAOs, now you need to have the, the community holders vote, you know, it has to pass and you know, have a certain quorum, pass a certain threshold, and then that is approved. Then there's also a window where it's kept open for any challenges. And then that security fix is deployed. 
right? So that duration is, you know, maybe a few hours, a few days, really. And that, by that time, the game is over, right? The contract has been exploited, the bug has been exploited, you know, all, all the tokens are taken. So again, huge impact from this perspective. From a technical perspective, what we are looking at is a new architecture, right? And this is again, and some of the other chains are even newer, right? So it's a much of a, uh, a sort of a bigger concern. New architecture with uh, the EVM virtual machine. We have uh, new languages, Solidity Viper. We have a new tool chain support. Some of you might have used Hard Hat, Truffle Brownie. I mean, there are many of these, uh, you know, not more than three or four years old. Security tools themselves, fantastic tools from, uh, you know, Trail of Bits, Slither, Consensus Diligence. Uh, I mean, these are the leaders in uh, the security space in blockchain, in Ethereum, specifically. Mythex, their tool, and there are some more. All these are not more than three or four years old, right? I mean, Ethereum itself is six years old from deployment. Compare and contrast this to Web2. Web2 has been around for three decades, internet for like four or five decades, and languages, I mean, the whole education of the space, the protocols have evolved, and all these supporting structures have matured, right? So it is not fair, right, um, on, uh, on technical folks such as, uh, I guess, you know, most of us here to um, compare uh, the security of a smart contract today and compare it to uh, security of something else, right? Some mission critical software in Web2 that's been deployed on Mars Rover. I mean, they have the, um, I mean, they deserve the same assurance level, but the maturity of underlying architectures are vastly different. The trajectories are vastly different, right? So this is, uh, in my opinion, a huge contributing factor to uh, security or lack thereof. Uh, let me fly through the other slides. I think we are uh, coming close to uh, 40 minutes in this uh, talk. The other aspect, you would have heard this, is uh, the concept of Byzantine uh, fault tolerance, right? Or uh, generalizing a team threat model. In Web2, we started with the notion of uh, trusted insiders and untrusted outsiders. So this, I mean, go back. Uh, if you've been around for like uh, 20, 30 years in this space, you will remember the concept of antiviruses. I mean, we still have these products, but when they started off, um, 20, 30 years ago, there was, and there still is the concept of a perimeter, right? That everything, I mean, uh, me as the owner of uh, my laptop or my phone, I am trusted. So whatever I do my device, there's fewer security measures that come in between us. But um, if it is a remote entity, right, then uh, they are untrusted. Right? So things like servers, where you're exposing the server to untrusted users accessing it. So those are untrusted because they're outside the trust perimeter. So that notion does not exist in Web3. And the reason for that is in Web3, everyone and everything is untrusted by default, by design. So the users themselves could become the abusers. And that's really how it should be constructed. Designed and anyone, right? Uh, if you're accessing a Web3 application, building a Web3 application, think about any, uh, you know, including the developer of the blockchain itself, the blockchain infrastructure providers, the tool providers, the developers themselves, the users, absolutely none of them can be considered as uh, sort of being part of your trusted computing base, right? Everything should be untrusted. So familiar with what is known as zero trust, which is a buzzword in the Web2 in, uh, in Web2 security in the last uh, maybe five years. Web3 is zero trust. Uh, I mean, it's the ultimate zero trust scenario, right? Nothing can trust each other. And this is really what uh, is known as Byzantine fault tolerance because any of these components, any of these players, any of their actions, right, actors and actions can 
be malicious at any point in time. They can start out as being uh, you know, benign, but they can become malicious at any point in time because of mechanism design, which is uh, really uh, you know what economics is about, right? So that aspect changes the nature of uh, security in Web3 for blockchains. Then let's dive into some of the other details, right? Uh, diving into some of the aspects of uh, um, things that you encounter in Web3 space. The notion of keys and tokens, right? So crypto is really all about cryptography uh, as much as we think it's about cryptocurrencies. And crypto space is really taking the keys Right? The, the private and public keys, the, the cryptography aspect, it's taking it to the masses, right? Because by design, the goal is for the users to maintain ownership of their keys, right? And uh, as much as uh, you know, some of us might use centralized exchanges, it's really the uh, focus of the trust, right? That everyone should own their keys and be responsible for it. Now, if you contrast that with passwords, um, as sort of what gives us access in the Web2 space. All of us have hundreds of passwords. Hopefully they're not really small, not our pets, not reused. But if something happens to those passwords, if they're uh, forgotten, if they're stolen, dumped, then there is a centralized third party, right? That service provider that you're used to going and saying, hey, can you restore my password, right? Can you reset it? This concept is uh, really non-existent when it keys in the Web3 space. So keys, you lose the keys or you lose uh, the secret uh, phrase, seed phrase behind those keys, the loss is permanent. The same thing applies to tokens. Tokens in Web3 space are, uh, you know, the Ether, the native currency, or any of uh, the ERC20 tokens that you're familiar with. These are borderless, right? I mean, they can be exchanged uh, uh, on any of these centralized exchanges. And if you look at that, right, and if you compare it with uh, data, that is really what is uh, stolen in the Web2 space, there's a big difference, right? The data that is stolen, if, if it is BII data is stolen, the worst case, your um, security data, let's say the US, right? or uh, I mean, EU has uh, uh, data, uh, you know, really stringent data uh, privacy laws, right? If that is stolen, there are repercussions, and this can happen after the data is, uh, um, you know, stolen and it may be traded in uh, what is known as a dark web uh, for like really pittance, right? Compare that to the loss of tokens, right? So in the case of data, there are maybe fines as a measure that happens later on on the entity that lost the data. There are regulations and uh, there are you know, maybe even entities where uh, it's possible for them to sort of reverse the loss uh, in the case of financial institutions. But tokens, you lose them, right? In the ideal case, I mean, uh, not, not in the case of centralized exchanges, but in decentralized scenarios, you lose the tokens, it's irreversible. Right, it's immutable and it is reversible. So this again plays a huge factor to security because it's really zero or one. If it is insecure, contracts lose the tokens, game is over. Right, in, in the worst case. The other big aspect is that contributes to security is uh, again a term that you will often encounter in Web three called composability. Web3, like it's uh, all about open source, but it's all also about being composable by design, right? So you deploy a smart contract, anyone else, any other protocol, any other project, and really talk to it, right? And this talking via APIs or via interfaces is permissionless in the ideal case, right? And these uh, accesses could be from users, it could be from other contracts, uh, from other protocols, and this composability is what is sort of you know leading 
the exponential innovation in the space, right? Because now you just have engineering, right? Somebody builds a uh, stable coin, and on top of that, you have a lending protocol, and on top of that, you have some other protocol that uh, aggregates all these together. So this composability is great, but from a security perspective, um, I think uh, this is one of the questions. How do you design blockchain security from a security perspective, uh, you know, from a testing perspective? It's really hard to do that because you really have very little control over what other component right, might work with your protocol right, after you deploy it. And before you do that, there are numerous other dependencies that you're working with. Right? Numerous other uh, libraries or uh, oracles or any other aspect that someone else has developed. Right? So those uh, dependencies and the various configurations, all these layers are moving pieces. Right? They're all changing as we speak. There's just so many versions coming up. All these aspects lead to uh, of composability lead to the attack surface. That's really uh, you know, that's really a critical aspect in uh, security. It's really not possible to define it, right, in, in a tangible, in a practical way. What happens is uh, this really leads to the explosion of uh, the vulnerabilities that, that can happen because of all these interactions. Uh, you really don't have this concept of uh, uh, threat uh, or a tag graph that you can determine uh, a priori. And these result in the exploits that we talked about. Yeah. And all these things are really are, are, are happening in a time scale, in a, in a compressed time scale. Right? So the composability, the openness aspect, the trust minimization, the permissionless part, the borderless part, there is no app that needs to approve your contract to be deployed. Everything is open source, so there is nothing somebody can do if you want to, you know, clone or fork something and uh, make some changes and deploy it. The licensing, of course, but um, you know that's really uh, legal uh, recourse, right? You can still access and modify and deploy in a way that breaks the licensing. That's possible. It's composability. These aspects coupled with token incentivized innovation. I mean, all these have built-in economics, right? You do have tokens. So the uh, protocol developers, the project teams, the, the, the early contributors, the community, everyone is incentivized to build it, to fund it, to test it, right? And use it. So these sort of, um, it's a vicious cycle, right? Or uh, on, uh, on sort of a positive note, I mean, this is really a, a, a cycle that sort of accelerates innovation. And I mean, the execution speed is really happening in, at a warp speed, right? And this is fantastic, uh, sort of a, a Cambrian explosion as it is referred to as, but from a security perspective, right? Move fast and break things really doesn't work well, especially if there are millions of dollars um, of, uh, you know, of, of uh, belonging to people from around the world who have put in these without really understanding how they work, it's not, uh, that's not a good thing, right? So safety is not uh, really, you know, kept in mind or takes the front seat from a design and development perspective, leading to vulnerabilities and exploits. And um, a good segue is, uh, Again, an answer to the question that was posed earlier is the testing is really critical, but it's also very, very hard to do um, in a production setting, right? I mean, in a Web2 world, we have a test environment and then we have production and maybe something in between. But in the Web3 space, test in prod with the off as sort of a meme, uh, there is some truth to it, right? The reasons, again, compressed time scales unrestricted composability, Byzantine threat model. I mean, you don't even know who the attackers are. There's really no way to build a attack graph. Uh, and even if, you know, uh, there are uh, potential exploits, uh, the bug bounties that uh, are becoming very popular in this space, 
given the stake, right? If the attacker can make away with six hundred million dollars, as we are sort of what is uh, top, what is a property that will to sort of become a white hat and report that vulnerability? Right? Byzantine threat model sort of uh, uh, and make design of it motivates such attack to sort of withhold so uh, exploit and wait till something gets deployed. wait till the tvl of the protocol uh, the the tokens managed by it reaches a certain uh, threshold and exploit right just want to say so, we have about five minutes left and we want to have time I, for questions too yeah um okay. i think mostly done so, uh, so yeah so makes it really hard to capture uh, what may be real world failure modes and uh, really pushes the testing um, real world testing economic testing right for economic attacks and for re uh, the really hard uh, logic bugs from composability for them to manifest only on the mainnet and not any of your tests and this has uh, led to the the space be on what are known as smart contract audits um, and audits are nothing but external assessment of uh, the security and in this case of smart contracts and the security software development life cycle is really popular too uh, has sort of compressed and it's really become a three-phase cycle in web3 it's build audit and launch when audit is considered as a silver bullet to really uh, find and fix all the bugs and make your contract bug free. This, this is definitely an unreal expectation. It's nowhere close to reality. Uh, it's uh, you know, theoretically not possible because of incompleteness and halting problem. Um, so the state of audits is uh, really uh, critical, but the number of experts, right? The number of auditors or security uh, experts who understand Ethereum, Web3 and security is very minimal. And the demand is maybe 10 or 100 times more than the supply, right? So this is sort of uh, hopefully motivating for the people here uh, to understand security is different, uh, why audits and smart security is important, and why uh, you may be interested in taking this up as uh, something to look at. And as uh, Jacob and uh, PG mentioned earlier, Securium is trying to um, you know, drive an effort in this space with uh, a bootcamp that focuses on smart contract security auditing. Um, I believe some of you have already applied uh, to this. Um, and as of this point, there are no more, uh, uh, I mean, we, all, we have 10,024 uh, participants, which is uh, uh, you know, an amazing number, totally unexpected. But I do encourage you to stay tuned with the Securium effort. Uh, path network or uh, through some of the links here. So with that, um, I will stop and uh, we have a few more minutes, but I'm happy to stay around for more questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rajiv. Um, quick question. Are these uh, links, can you, um, or, or even the slides, would, would you be able to make that available to other participants here so they can uh, go through and peruse and find the links as well. Is that possible? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, uh, sharing a video. So let mm -hmm. me, um, let me let me copy paste the links and send it over to you that you can share in your newsletter or your uh, channels. That can All be right, done. perfect. Um, and then uh, we had a couple of questions, other questions from the audience, and I also had uh, some questions as well. So let's just. Um, run through a couple of these really quickly. Um, first off, is there like a checklist or a guide or something like that that you would recommend that um, smart contract developers could like reference for security purposes? It's like some general um, things. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm uh, pretty biased in that sense. So security, I did <laughs> together a uh, checklist, a really long one with uh, one, one sort of uh, smart contract security checklist. Uh, but there are many others as well. I mean, Consensus Visions has uh, many best practices. Trailer Bits has uh, many best practices. 
open Zeppelin, uh, which is uh, you know one of the uh, leaders in the space. I so love open Zeppelin. Have, yeah, they have many workshops, video tutorials. There is no dearth for information. It's just that uh, the space is so fast; these get out in a few months. Um, right. So, so you yeah. Um, yeah, so make sure to check out. So um, PG posted in the chat the link to the Securium newsletter where you can find uh, find that. That'll also be in our follow up email. Um, oh, and PG okay. found found the link. Perfect. Thank you. Um, awesome. Awesome. Okay, and then I'm sure everyone is wondering because we just had you know the massive six hundred million dollar hack. Um, apparently, according to Poly Network, um, earlier this morning or or earlier this day, I suppose, depending on where you are, um, about $300 million of the assets have been returned by the hacker, um, which is kind of interesting, fun update. Um, but because this is such a big deal, um, what are some of the unique security challenges that cross-chain projects like Poly Network have to deal with? And, and what are some good like testing strategies or considerations that developers could have? Uh, I, I don't think there's a good answer to that. And that's just because, uh, um, you know, we, we are uh, barely, from a security perspective, we are sort of barely catching up with the single chain. Um, and when you look at cross chain aspects, there are, uh, uh, you know, for, understand multiple chain, right? The, the way they interact, what are, uh, um, uh, you know, when it comes to the bridges that actually, uh, the bridge contracts that uh, uh, control uh, on these cross transfers, um, where they vetted, mm -hmm. uh, the security behind that. And again, going back to the concept of audits, where they audited, I mean, uh, it's it's not, not enough if uh, we just know if they were audited, right? Uh, mm -hmm. What what was the result of the audit, right? I mean, maybe audit uh, flagged 100 critical things. Did the even fix any of those things before deploying that, mm -hmm. right? So, so that uh, aspect sort of multiplies exponentially. Um, I think we are really, really early with the uh, cross-chain projects, uh, many of them. Uh, Connect and uh, uh, Tor, and I mean, I had not heard, personally heard of uh, Poly Network, so so I think we have a long way to go before uh, we figure out what strategy is for testing. All right, um, yeah, we're we're definitely really really early. Um, on that note of smart contract audits, I've noticed that on EtherScan, if if you have had your contract audited, sometimes there will be a link on EtherScan where it says this contract has been audited and then you can go and actually read the audit. So that's just a little um, pro tip for some of those contracts um, there. Um, something you were talking about, like how, how there's different security considerations for like the Mars Rover or something like that. And obviously that's a little bit of a extreme example because I, I think it's a very, very select few people who end up getting to work on the Mars Rover, um, but a little bit more generally, I suppose, um, I've heard that working on like smart contracts is kind of similar to working with embedded systems, like what you might put on a Mars rover or something like that. So, um, what kind of uh, would you also draw that comparison, and in what way? Yeah, um, fantastic question. Um, this comes up often um, from a security perspective. People would like to would like the developers and the projects to pay the same level of attention when it comes to security um, for smart contracts that would if we're developing that contract or, or that application for uh, some mission critical as uh, you know uh, any software or uh, healthcare systems where real lives are involved or uh, some of the critical infrastructure protection I know any of the IoT aspects, there are huge and things like that, right? Which which has uh, significant ramifications more than just data being leaked, right? So that mm -hmm. I think is a critical aspect. Uh, so from a security perspective, uh, people also make this 
person because uh, of the resource uh, uh, requirements of uh, let's say smart contract platforms versus uh, something like embedded system. Both of them resource constraint. Uh, so that that is uh, some of the thing. But but besides that, going back to safety, I think that's uh, you know, that, that's something to be kept in mind, right? Every line of your smart contract is potentially worth thousands, uh, if not you know millions of dollars. Right. So right. Uh, so paying that level of attention, due diligence, uh, design, uh, all the way to development and testing and beyond monitoring is really critical. All right, thank you so much. Um, I actually have to jump now, so I'm going to turn over the rest of the questions to PG now. Um, but thank you so much, Rajiv. Quick reminder for everyone to go sign up to his newsletter, the Securium newsletter, and pay attention for uh, more recruitments for the Securium uh, bootcamp, and hop on his Discord server too. Fantastic. Thank you, Jacob. Thanks, Jacob. Amazing. And actually, we have uh, um, a quick suggestion from the audience, Rajiv, on your newsletters. Uh, Maria is asking, uh, uh, it'd be great to add an evaluation on the hack on your secure newsletter and how to best evaluate these bridges uh, um, vulnerabilities. Just quick, you know, feedback from the audience. Uh, um, another thing that I, you know, I wanted to ask you, like, uh, right away, is like, since we've talked about, like, how early we are with all of this, uh, can you just remind uh, the people here how many like certified smart contract auditors are there actually right now in the world? Because I think that's a good data point. That's that's a fantastic question, um, and the answer is we don't know. <laughs> so uh, the space so far that uh, things change. Um, so the information that uh, you know, unfortunately, Web three there centralized right they're all over the space so one of the uh, things that we would like to that would uh, drive the effort is really get this information um, so really the, the last time I looked, uh, there were about 30 40 smart content auditing uh, firms or uh, teams um, if, if we can call that um, and uh, they were all around the world right and uh, if we assume that maybe there are uh, five to ten people in each of those teams, that's the best case scenario, right? So we're really looking at a number, which I think is really uh, maybe around 100, right? So or let's 100. So you have 200 people that uh, are really uh, are sort of shouldering the responsibility of uh, uh, the sum total, I mean, I, I don't know what that number is. Uh, if you look at any of your cryptocurrency trackers, right? Um, the thousand coins that are listed on, on Mestari or any, uh, any other place add up their circulating value. So the dollar to the to that person, one certified auditor as a PG, I think that was sort of a tongue in cheek thing called was nowhere to be found in the web 2 space right so that i think for uh, people who are in universities uh, if uh, some of your students uh, or professionals um, this is uh, a great place to get in if you're really interested in security the opportunities are endless uh, even with some going through something like a, a boot camp uh, if you are coming from a web 2 security space you'll find that you can work and uh, at the same time. So huge opportunities, huge challenges, a lot of impact to be made. I couldn't agree more. And actually to that point, uh, people are asking, can can we still apply to the Securums Bootcamp? Uh, unfortunately uh, not. Um, and uh, I mean, the goal goal to model, when it was announced was to have 100 People, uh, but we have 800 applications and uh, ended wow. in uh, 20, 1024 um, app, uh, applications and everyone who applied is now considered as a participant. Um, so there are just some practical reasons uh, to not to sort of keep this in check. 
but um, if you know there's there is good interest and the community i mean do join the discord uh, all the material that is going to be produced that's going to be used in the boot camp is going to be made publicly available you're not going to um so yeah that's that's sort of uh, where we are i guess then um side question to that are you going to be running a second cohort eventually in the future uh, yeah, I mean, this question is popping up uh, so many times that it, uh, you know, if there's enough interest uh, and value that we can add as part of this bootcamp, uh, definitely why not? So, yeah, to, uh, to the person asking uh, Lanchel Brutus uh, bootcamp, um, absolutely, right? Uh, so, there will be others. And I mean, there, there is, it's still open to learn. Um, so, hop on to the I think there are some details which will uh, make you happy. You'll still be able to access all the videos, all the content. Um, so, don't be, uh, I mean, that, that's the goal of uh, Securium at a higher level. Rajiv, thank you so, so much. I know it's late there. Um, so, good night. And uh, for everyone else, uh, I'll see you in the networking portion.